I'm going to talk about continuous retrospectives. The first slide is probably the most important because it has my contact information on it. And this talk is like many others I give where I think if it's important and you think it's important, I'm happy to send you the PowerPoint. So you've got my email address here, Linda at lindarising.org. And I'll be happy to send you the PowerPoint to give to someone else in your organization who you think might be interested. That way, all the information that's in there will be yours for sharing. Also, let's connect on LinkedIn. So I'm gonna go back to 1998. I can't see all of you, but how many of you were alive in 1998? <laughs> okay, good, that's a kind of a joke. I was working at a medium-sized telecom company. The project that was supposed to save the company failed miserably after three years of putting off that very uncomfortable decision. At the time, I was working on design patterns. I was a designer. My boss came to me and he said, Linda, I know you're working on patterns. And so could it be that we would have learned something from this massive failure that would give us some patterns so that we would not do this again, so that we would have a chance to learn from this experience? He said, can you do that? Can you somehow meet with the team, find out what went on, learn from that, document some patterns? And I said, I don't know. I, I can talk to a couple of people that I know are interested in this, but I don't know of any patterns that will help teams avoid failure, but it certainly would be a worthwhile exercise. So at the time, I had a very good friend. I don't know if you recognize him. This is his picture on the left. His name is Norm Kurth. And in 1998, he was writing a book on something that he called retrospectives. Norm is the person who created that term. We had a very different word for it. And in fact, we had a very different exercise that we did on software projects. He wanted to change everything. So he wrote a book that was published in 2001. And in 1998, if it had not been for Norm Kurth leading me through the exercise, where the goal was to find patterns that would help us in the future, that would help us learn from what went on, I would not have been able to do it. I owe Norm Kurth an enormous debt, as do all of you. If you do retrospectives, if you even understand what a retrospective is, it's because Norm Kurth wrote this book that was published in 2001. If you haven't read it, you should read it. If you have read it, read it again, because this is the word that we used, post-mortem. It's Latin. It means after death. And when physicians do a post-mortem, they're doing it on a body, a dead body. And no matter what they learn, it can't help this person. It's too late. That's what we did. That's what we did in software. We held a post-mortem, we looked at what happened, we documented it, we put it somewhere, and nobody ever looked at it again. Norm changed all that. He said, this is something different. This is not a post-mortem. This is something to help living projects because the focus should be not on what went wrong and who's to blame. It's about learning. We wanna learn from what happened on this project and we wanna get better over time. A totally new concept for standing back and looking at what happened. 
every retrospective should begin with Norm's take on what should go on in a retrospective. It's called the prime directive. Regardless of what we discover, we must understand and truly believe that everyone did the best job he or she could. This is not about blaming or fault finding. Of course, we know more now. Given what we knew at the time, our skills and abilities, the resources available, of course, we learned, we made mistakes. And then in 2001, another significant event. A meeting of a bunch of old white guys at a ski lodge in Colorado. And they created something called the Agile Manifesto. And one of the principles spoke directly to the kind of thing that Norm was advocating. One of the principles of the Agile Manifesto says at regular intervals, the team reflects. So that means think. The team reflects on how to be more effective. So they want to learn. Then tunes and adjusts. So this is small, makes little changes based on what they learn. Of course, there have been other books now since. The primary one, in my opinion, was in 2006 when Esther Derby and Diana Larson wrote about agile retrospectives. Now the iterations are shorter. We're not going to wait until the end of a project. We're going to do it every two weeks, every 30 days, whatever the iteration size happens to be. A very different approach to retrospectives. These are not only good books, but they're available on the web. I would ask you to raise your hands. I don't know if you're familiar with the InfoQ mini, mini books, but they are free. If you just go to infoq.com slash mini books, you're going to find not only this book on retrospectives by Ben Linders, which I think is excellent, but also many other books about other software related topics. And you can download the PDF for free. Please do so. So we've had a little history. I'm going to tell you a little bit about my primary interest now, which is in neuroscience. What we know about your brain is there's a very small area. It sits above your right ear. It's called the right temporal parietal junction or RTPJ. And that part of your brain is activated when you think about what will happen when you contemplate the future. It's also active when you think about what other people are thinking. When you get together with other people and you share your thoughts, the RTPJ is activated. It's an area that children do not have. It takes a long time to develop. It's in a newer part of our brains. Significantly, it's also the part of the brain that's involved in creativity and innovation. It's the part that's involved when we do nothing, when we daydream. And what we know now, unfortunately, is most of us never do nothing. We are always busy. If you have a spare moment, even if you don't have a spare moment, you must always do two things or three things at the same time. You cannot just do nothing. If you don't exercise parts of your brain, what we know is they begin to shrink. Your brain changes all the time based on what you do, based on your behavior. So if you don't take time, to do nothing, the part of your brain involved in creativity and innovation, being concerned about what other people think, that part of your brain begins to shrink. What we know from cognitive neuroscience is that there are a lot of things that are important to do to help you do a better job of thinking. One of them is to move. 
most of the time we sit all day. We don't move at all. Most of the time we don't take breaks often. Most of the time, even now, when we're homebound, we're not getting enough sleep. We're worried and anxious. Our sleep is disturbed. We never take naps. Well, that would be a waste of time, wouldn't it? We're not conscious or aware of what we eat or drink. We consume too many caffeinated beverages. We've lost our contact with nature. And we don't pay attention to what's in the environment, especially with regard to plants, other animals, babies. So that's a downside of a meeting retrospective. When we sit in a room with other people, then we are, everything we do is in conflict with the things that are best for our brains. We're sitting, we do not have natural light, the meeting has a fixed ending, so it's time boxed. Okay, guys, we have one hour to do this retrospective. Be creative, be innovative, let's learn, and we have one hour to do it. Most of us can't remember what happened on that project. Most of us can't remember what happened two weeks ago. I don't know about you, but being locked down, all the days are the same. We have to remind ourselves, today is Monday, today is Tuesday, today is Wednesday. They are all alike, they're running into one another. Oh, at an exercise once in uh, a meeting conference, I said, let's see if we can improve retrospectives. Let's look at what cognitive neuroscience tells us would make it better. Can you come up with ideas? I said, how can we do a better job of taking a break? How can we do a better job of involving sleep and naps, nature, color, eating, drinking. People came up with all kinds of wonderful ideas, and I thought, now what we have to do is make retrospectives better. We will do a better job, because now this will be based on science. It will help us. And then in 2013, I attended a conference called FlowCon, and I kept hearing, continuous this continuous that, continuous delivery, continuous integration, continuous testing. And I suddenly thought, why, why not continuous retrospectives? And I realized I had my own moment of insight. I've got it backwards. Instead of taking what we do now with retrospectives and trying to force fit what cognitive neuroscience is telling us about making us better, why don't we get rid of what we're doing now and change retrospectives so they match the evidence from neuroscience? And how am I going to do that? Well, I'm also a believer in small experiments. So I met with a couple of teams and we said, why don't we start with the timeline exercise? I don't know if you do that in your retrospectives, but it looks like this. There's a uh, event schedule across the top. And then for each event, there are cards that people write about. This is what happened on this particular day. This is how I felt about it. Why don't we use the timeline and we'll do it in real time? We don't want to wait until the end of the iteration or the end of the project. Let's do it as it happens. It'll be a real time timeline. At the beginning of each iteration, we will start building the timeline and we'll do it every day. We will stand in front of this timeline. We will build it during standups. As we think of ideas, we will add them to the timeline. We will do this continuously. As we think of things, we won't wait until the end of the iteration or the end of the project. We'll do it all the time. We will continuously reflect what's working well today. What ideas do I have to make things better? What experiments would I like to try? What puzzles me? What insights have I had? And let's post them on the timeline. I'm going to take a brief savvy here out to a book that was 
published in 2011. At the time, I was struggling to read it. I read it three times. Uh, if I could see you, I would ask you if you've read Thinking Fast and Slow, but I expect the answer would be, yes, you've heard of it. Maybe you even bought it, but unfortunately, you just haven't had time to read it. And it's one of the most important books that has been written in the last hundred years. So system one is the unconscious. It's very fast. It's intuitive. It remembers everything. So that's where all your expertise is in system one. The problem is it's unconscious. You can't communicate with it, not directly. System two is the conscious mind, which is what we think thinking is. When we say think about something, we do that consciously. The problem with the conscious mind is that it's very slow. It's linear, it cannot multitask. It's busy all the time. It uses an enormous amount of energy. About 20% of what we actually use goes to run system two. And the research around those two systems says, you know, we used to believe that this part of the, this is like a picture of an iceberg. It's really a fake. It's not a real iceberg. This top part of the iceberg, the scientists used to believe, well, that is system two, very small, whereas system one, whoa, whoa, whoa it's really huge. But the research now shows that See this little tiny snowball up here? That's system two. And the rest of this, that's system one. So the message, the big takeaway from Kahneman's research is we are not using that. We spend too much time up here with this little snowball and that's especially true for retrospective. Now people will argue saying, you know, the system one, yeah, it's huge, it's enormous, it has all your expertise, but it also has a whole host of cognitive biases. Yes, that's true. And this is the worst. It's called confirmation bias. Basically, it says, if you believe anything, doesn't matter whether it's political, whether it has to do with software development, whether it has to do with playing golf, it doesn't matter. Any idea that you have, once you believe it, you are actively gonna filter all the other information, anything you hear, anything you see, anything you read, is all gonna be filtered so that it reinforces what you already believe. It's very hard for you to look at disconfirming information. You have a bias toward hanging on to what you already believe. And the more important it is to you, the more strongly you will hold on to that. Clear evidence for that in the United States today, as we are politically divided and the two sides cannot talk to one another. It's a sign of the times. I like what Charles Darwin did. He said, whenever a published fact, a new observation or thought came across me, which was opposed to my general results, I made a memorandum of it without fail and at once. For I had found by experience that such facts and thoughts were for more apt to escape from the memory than favorable ones. Owing to this habit, very few objections were raised against my views, which I had not at least noticed an attempt to answer. He made sure that when he saw something that at first glance he didn't agree with, he wrote it down. He knew that his mind was going to actively work against it and at some point would discount it completely. So he made sure to capture it. That was his timeline. And that's exactly what we decided to do to overcome this bias. As you have ideas, you have to write it down and listen to what others have to say. So how does a continuous reflection period work? 
based on neuroscience. For one thing, you're not sitting in a room with a time box limit of one hour. You sleep on it, you think about it. Your unconscious mind is working on that problem or that issue 24 seven. The unconscious never sleeps. We know that you're gonna go away and come back the next day. So you've had a chance to sleep on it. We know you're gonna be standing up and walking in front of that timeline. So you're moving. We know that everybody can post. And so now you'll have to look at what other people are saying. That's very good for overcoming confirmation bias. In fact, it is the only way to overcome confirmation bias is to hang out with people who don't agree with you. We also know that if you have a chance to write it down and put it on the wall, then you don't have to think about it anymore. Once you've processed it, it reduces your cognitive load system too, uses a lot of energy, and this will help reduce that. It's called the Zagarnik effect. A quote from David Friedman, who said, current prescriptions for change routinely recommend destabilizing disruptive approaches. These approaches may be pulled off once, maybe a few times, but repeated attempts to undergo massive change result in burnout, cynicism and chaos. The Marines have dedicated groups exploring new approaches. As this research pays off in workable concepts, the new ideas are incorporated into Marine practices on an ongoing basis. Thus, the Corps is undergoing constant, gradual change, continuous change. Even though the change can ultimately be significant, it tends to happen one small step at a time. The Marine Corps is very agile and they are always learning. They are always changing and so are we. We know that if you have a chance, you will also incorporate your thoughts with your values. Those guys who created the Agile Manifesto talked about values. What do we think is important? What do we really care about? If we don't have a chance to think about that, if everything we do must be done in an hour, a time boxed period, we don't have the time to reflect on values. If we're constantly coming up with ideas for learning and improvement, we'll have a better chance of tying those to things we deeply believe in, things we think are important, what our goals are, what our purpose is. In 2015, as I was working on continuous retrospectives, I saw a wonderful presentation by a guy from France. His name is Matty Schneider. And um, Lee's links are good. I just checked them yesterday. His presentation is on YouTube. He wrote a paper about the guide board. It's still out there. And his thesis is out there. He has a, something that I think is better than a timeline. I suggest it. I, I think people should experiment with whatever works. But it's a wonderful take on the timeline, better than Kanban, in my opinion. Please have a look. Let's close with some research. This is from Harvard Business Review. I'm a subscriber. If you can't find this paper, I'll be happy to send it to you. They ask software developers to spend the last 15 minutes of every day writing about what they had been learning. The control group, because if this is a real experiment, we need to have a control group, they didn't do anything. They just kept working for another 15 minutes. And what they noticed by measuring performance on a test was that that group that had a chance to just spend 15 minutes, a small time for reflection, increased performance on the test by an average of 22.8%. So we know the benefits of reflection. We know the benefits of thinking about what we do. It's been measured. Well, if we're going to do continuous retrospectives, what about those others? Do we need to do one at the end of a project? Do we need to do one at the end of the iteration? And the answer is yes. 
because they all have different goals. Project retrospectives are about strategies, long-term plans, learning. Iteration retrospectives are about tactics. What should we do now to get ready for the next iteration? And continuous retrospectives, they're about all those little experiments, ideas that we have continuously. And just three days ago, I reviewed a new book. It's not out yet, but please watch for it. This is a new book on retrospectives, includes anti-patterns, and of course, what everybody is doing now, online retrospectives. So it never ends. It's to be published by Pearson. You should experiment. I hear from so many people, our oh, retrospectives aren't working well. Well, maybe you need to try some experiments in your retrospectives, not just experiments with your development process, but experiments about how you do what you do. I've written two books with my good friend, Mary Lynn on fearless change and more fearless change. There are lots of patterns there for organizational change, I recommend them highly. So I'll have a look at the chat. I'm gonna stay around and I guess where it's gonna be an open space afterwards.